Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net and welcome to today's comic art demonstration. In this video, we are going to be working on a brand new character concept for my upcoming comic book series, Renegade Alpha. Now, we are still in the pre-production phases of this project and so what that involves is a lot of character conceptualization i'm trying to figure out how are all the main characters of this book actually going to look what kind of environments are they going to be in what kind of weaponry will they have and what types of villains are they going to fight how are they going to look so it is arguably one of the most fun stages of the comic book production process because this is the the, the world building portion of that you know we're getting to know these characters we're, we're figuring them out for the first time it's all fresh and new but the most important reason for going to the trouble of doing up a full-blown character sheet for most of the main characters that are going to be featured within the comic book is because as we're drawing them from one panel to the next, we want to maintain a certain level of consistency because lack of consistency is going to pull the reader right out of the story and break their suspense of disbelief. It's going to break their immersion. We don't want that. We want to hit hypnotize them the moment that they open up that cover and start reading the story we want them to be there in that world with the characters so we don't want to draw attention to any of those potential inconsistency is if they do arise and the best way in which we can avoid that is by having a point of reference a reference sheet that shows our character from a range of different angles and a range of point of perspectives and and allows us to get to know the design from the front, the back, and the side so that we can effectively draw this character with that, uh, the, that those high levels of consistency. And again, if we can do that, then we allow the audience to sink into the story and become a part of that world without really noticing that they are just reading a book at the end of the day. We want them to forget that. We want to give them an experience, an immersive experience. Let's talk about what's happening on the screen here. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is that I am working from an extremely far off distance. I'm zoomed all the way out here. And this is actually the size at which I'm working. I'm keeping it rough and loose, very, very sketchy. Nothing is polished at this point in time because I want to give myself the freedom to explore. I want to see what I can come up with here. If I start getting too tight on the line work early on, then what ends up happening is I get I get married to what's there on the page. I become afraid, scared, nervous to erase the stuff that I'm laying down because I've already invested a ton of time and energy into it. So I don't really want to rejig things. I don't want to rejig that polished, sharp looking line work. And so that means that there's a certain lack of exploration that ends up happening, which I do not want at this stage. This is the stage where I get to be most creative. I get to explore. I get to experiment. And during that time, it's just inevitable that I'm going to be pulling out the eraser a, a, a lot. Uh, and by a lot, I mean that I am switching constantly back and forth between my pencil and between the eraser taking out things that I've laid down and retrying other avenues of a design exploration that I could potentially uh, settle upon in the final design, you know, and you want to make sure that you're always giving yourself that space to be creative because otherwise what you end up doing is you confine it and when you confine that creativity well you just you're confining your potential the potential for that idea to blossom into its its ultimate level of capacity you know i mean if you give up and you stop exploring if you stop creating before you've really explored all your options then you just really don't know what you could have ultimately ended up with creativity isn't linear at least i don't think it is it it branches out there's a there's, a, there's an entire web that we can explore of different ideas and different options this is the, the why we're so passionate about it you know because it never ends 
And when it ever ends, it keeps you hooked. There's always something new there. You never get bored. That's what's so wonderful about it, at least for me. I know that some people like to have a game plan. They like to know exactly what is going to happen before the pencil ever hits the page. And truth be told, I am kind of like that from time to time. I mean, you could say that what I'm doing here is creating a blueprint for my characters that uh, will be featured within Renegade Alpha. And I get it, I understand that. I That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm creating a plan here so that, I, again, I got something that I can reference back to and I redraw this character again and again in the, uh, the paneled sequential artwork. That's important, as I already said, though, to keep that consistency, to make sure that we're suspending that disbelief within the audience. However... That's why it's all the more important for me to take the creative liberty here and make sure that I don't get too tight on those pencils, that I don't marry myself to the first thing that I lay down onto the page. That just wouldn't be a good idea because, as with anybody else, it takes me some time to warm up. I'm not at my best the, f the moment that I boot up my PC, load up Photoshop or Manga Studio and start drawing, uh, usually I've got to make a fair few mistakes. I've got to put some errors down onto the page before I start really arriving at what it is that I'm looking for. And then, and only then, will I start to get tighter on my penciled line work, which is exactly what you can see me transitioning into right now. It is still loose, it is still kind of rough, and I am still working from a distance at this point. But we're getting tighter here. We're solidifying some of the key primary design elements that this character is going to consist of. Now, I want to really touch on and get into why I'm working from such a distance in this demonstration, because it is a question that I get a lot. Clayton, do you really work from that that level of Zoom? Are you really that, that distanced from your own work? How do you see what's going on? And that's kind of the point of it. I don't want to I don't want to get into the details right now of the drawing. I don't want to render anything. I don't want to put in my new little tiny intricate texture details or anything like that. So I don't really need to zoom in. Nor should my mind be in a place where it is worrying about that tier of development just yet. Because that kind of comes later on in the process. That's the finishing touches. For me, the details is probably the fastest point within the process. This stage, the foundational stage, where I'm getting the character blocked in and I'm working out the broader overall considerations of how their design is going to look, that's what takes me time. And oftentimes, character concept art takes me the longest amount of time, even more so than sequentials, because... I just don't know how this character is going to wind out. I have absolutely no idea. You can see that I just completely erased everything that I had done on his upper body. Why? Because I didn't like the look of the design for the chest armor, the torso armor that I'd wrapped around his body. And so I went back to the drawing board. I kept on exploring, and it's okay to do that at this point because... You know, I, I don't want to be looking back on this character design unsatisfied. Whatever I lay down on the page and arrive at by the end of this demonstration, that's what I am going to have to stick with because this is the you know this is the character design sheet. This is what I'm going to be working from when it comes to redrawing this character up for the comic book. So you know it's I allow myself to make mistakes here, to take the time. Even if I erase the entire character, all the progress that I've made up until this point, and completely redo it, rehash the entire thing, that is absolutely fine and okay. It is worth it. As I said, in the long run, I'm going to be redrawing this character hundreds, thousands possibly more times depending on how long this series goes for. And so, you know, it's important that I get it right now because if I change my mind later on and I decide that the design is just not working, well, you know, and 
my character Shooter here ends up looking completely different in uh, issue two than he did from issue one because I changed my mind. I didn't really take the time to explore the design uh, and arrive at something that I was really, really happy with. People are going to be like, what the heck, you know? You, you showed me the character. I got to know that character and how they looked, and now he's drawn completely differently. He's wearing something else entirely. This isn't the same character I became familiar with. This isn't the same character I'm used to. It's different. People don't like different. It destroys that suspense of disbelief, as inconsistencies tend to do. It's like, for example, you know, say that you've got a friend, a mate that you catch up with and you're used to the way he looks uh, or she looks for that matter. But then one day they turn up and they've got like bright purple hair just out of nowhere. Like before they had regular colored hair, like brown or, you know, black or blonde, whatever. But then they come out with this fluorescent purple hair. It's different. It's crazy. It's like, what are you done with my friend here? Right. And yeah, it's cool, but you know, it takes you back. You need to that time to register it, get used to it again, and you need to get to know your friend. And and you know, after a while, you don't really notice the the purple hair anymore. But you know, it is going to take you back. It is going to keep you on your toes, and that's not really necessarily what you want when it comes to comic book characters. You want them to, you know, initially have enough interest there to get into the story. And then the idea is that you hold them there. You don't really want to be jolting them out of the hypnosis that you're trying to pull them into within that story. The the immersive state at which they need to be in in order to have that full-blown, almost virtual reality experience. No, it sounds kind of silly, but that's what happens. You know, they go into that... Their, their brain waves change. It's like watching a movie. They just time slips away, and they're really before from the moment that they open up the front cover to the moment that they close a the back cover. Time is is outside of them. They don't really notice what's happening in the world around them because they're they're right there in the story. And the only way to keep them there is to maintain a super high level of consistency. And if you do introduce changes, then Okay, sure, that's fine and good and dandy, but make sure you do it in a strategic way, a way in which gently transitions the audience from the story being one way and into it being another way. If indeed a change is absolutely necessary, there should be a rhyme and there should be a reason for doing so. All right, now let's talk about... Again, why I had zoomed out so far. The reason as to why I'm working even from a distance now, you can see that I've got the entire character on the screen in front of me. I can see them. I've got a wholesome point of perspective on exactly how everything on this page is coming together. And that's exactly why I am working from a distance. If I zoom in too close, and I'm used to working from this distance, so keep that in mind, all the details that I add in, that those high intensity uh, cross hatches that are used for the rendering and, and what have you, the way in which I drop down line weights, it's all done so based on the fact that I usually worked from a distanced level of zoom. And so... I'm used to it, right? Most other artists may feel the need to zoom in in order to get the level of detail that I'm able to get without doing so, right? Without having to zoom in. But the reason that I work from a distance in the first place, the reason that I accustom myself to doing so, especially now, is because I've learned a lot of valuable lessons along the way when it comes to producing my comic book art. And one of them is that if I zoom in too far, one, I'm not able to dial and disperse the level of detail, rendering, textures and materials as accurately across the character as a whole. Sure, I'm able to get those details looking great in one particular section. Say, for example, if I zoomed in on his his shoulder or even his upper torso, right? I could get the details looking great there, but then that may very well be unbalanced in comparison to the amount of detail and texture work that I add to his legs or even his head. So I got to see how all of this is coming together as as one thing. 
Because if I'm just focused in on certain sections, I can get those certain sections looking great, but does it all pull together in the end? Does it all read as one drawing consistently? Not necessarily, at least for me. I find that kind of difficult. And so, especially in the beginning stages, as we're laying down this character's pose, as we're figuring out how he's going to be positioned on the page, I'm zoomed out to the max because otherwise I don't know whether or not the position I placed his right arm in is going to is going to complement the position I've placed or even make sense in comparison to the position that I've placed his left leg in as an example I've got to see the full movement throughout the human body it sounds kind of strange and maybe some people find that to be a weird way of working but that is just for me what is going to allow me to ensure the best chance of success for my drawings I got to make sure I've got that wholesome view of the foundations before I venture on to especially this stage where now you can see me transitioning into the highly polished penciling stage now the other reason as to why it's good to work from a distance is because I have found that it significantly speeds up the production time, the amount of time that I'm spending on a piece. Because if I'm zoomed all the way in, I'm adding in tons and tons of detail, probably that I don't need to be adding in in the first place. And then on top of that, because of the amount of detail I'm adding in, that additional line work, it's taking me longer. It's, it's additional workload. I mean, I could be zoomed out at half the distance and only spend half the amount of time working on that piece. Do you get what I'm saying? And so for me, I just found it to be a much more optimized way of working. I could draw more, get more done, and also at the same time have a much more balanced looking end product and drawing um, you know thing the detail within that the way in which the, the line work was weighted it would all kind of be nicely dispersed across the entire figure instead of just being clustered together in particular sections so this is a lesson that took me a little while to learn and the reason as to why it took me a while to learn is because you know, I would zoom in just a tiny bit and I'd find that I'd end up with this over-detailed piece of artwork. And it'd take me like a month to complete because I just added in that many details. So everybody's different. you got to figure out, well, what level of detail do I want in my drawings? And if that is so, at what distance do I feel comfortable working at in order to achieve it? Right, Because some people, in order to get the same level of detail that I am able to get within my work, they've, they have to zoom in, right? So everybody's an individual. Us as artists, we have our own ways of working. And it's important that when you're being creative, you are comfortable. Because if you're uncomfortable, that's going to cut off your... Well, it's going to make it less fun, that's for sure. Less fun. And you're probably, as a result, not going to be as creative if you're not having fun. And that's one lesson that I've I really learned lately, is that drawing should never feel like a task. I shouldn't be drawing to end up with the end product. I, in other words, I shouldn't set out to necessarily create a character for character's sake here. For the character's sake. I shouldn't even set out to draw this character for the sake of my comic book. I know that doesn't make sense, but bear with me. I should be drawing for the mere joy of drawing, right? And so even when it comes to working on his knee pads, for example, uh, example rather, as you can see me doing here, and not examples, I know I'm giving lots of examples today, but as I said, as an example, the knee pads, that's a boring element, right? The knee pads aren't all that fun to draw. It's not that riveting of a, of a, of a subject matter. But if I'm just drawing that knee pad because I enjoy drawing, then all of a sudden that does make it more fun. Am I making sense here? And so that's what I've recently found because, you know, there was a certain amount of apprehension I had 
been experiencing when setting out to first initially do these character concepts and especially the the draft for Renegade Alpha. And by the way, just so you know, all 45 pages of Renegade Alpha are now drafted out. They're they're ready to go into the finals. I just need to get these characters sorted. I need to figure out, you know, what exactly are they going to look like before I do up those final pages and uh, and really bring this comic book to life. But you know, a- as I was saying, it's um it's something that I realized uh, you know I was being apprehensive about. And I wasn't sure why I was feeling apprehensive, because I enjoy drawing. And when I start drawing, when I get past that apprehension, I'm actually in it. I'm there. I'm moving my stylus on the tablet. I'm seeing the artwork get closer and closer to being finished. I enjoy that. I really do. It's one of the most pleasurable acts that that I can that I can ever indulge in and to be able to do that every day is such a wonderful thing it's something that I'm so so thankful for I mean to be able to do that every day not have to you know go to a a day job that takes my attention away from that I know that I'm I'm extremely uh privileged to be able to do so you know I it's been a lot of hard work to get to that point sure but don't get me wrong I'm so thankful for that and so I was wondering where this apprehension was coming from, and I realized it's because when I, when I was getting, in, when I was thinking about what it was I wanted to create, that was the problem. I was thinking about what it was I wanted to create, not about the process itself. And so I was building it up in my head. I was like, oh man, I've got to get a character done today. You know, I've got to figure out how long it's going to take me. And I was trying to keep these characters to, you know, a day or two in order to draw them up. And I was stressing about making sure that I got them done on time, f- figuring out exactly how many character designs I could fit into the months before I decided to actually jump into the comic book and do up those final pages. And all of those thought processes that were going through my mind was just making the the whole process so much less fun. You know, I'd forgotten the reason as to why I love drawing in the first place. It wasn't to stress out about deadlines. It wasn't to stress out about getting things done at a particular time or, or getting things to look a certain way. You know, if a character design didn't work out the way I wanted it to the first go around... That was something that kind of disheartened me. I get pissed off about it. I was annoyed that I didn't meet my deadline for that day. And especially at this stage within the pre-production process, that was an unreasonable expectation for me to have on myself because mistakes are inevitable at this point. You know, you want to make sure that you're making mistakes, if anything, and that you're ironing out the bugs (laughs) within your artwork, that you are arriving at character designs that are really going to do this comic book justice, that are going to excite people, that are going to represent the characters that you're featuring within, that I'm featuring within my comic book and within your comic book if you're designing your own characters to to the their highest potential in in the best possible vision that you can create for them but again you know all of that pressure was was freaking me out and so i decided you know what i really love drawing and today i'm just going to draw I'm going to work on this character. I don't know whether or not I'm going to be able to finish them. I don't know what it's going to look like by the end, but I'm going to have fun with it. And what that allowed me to do was it allowed me to become more immersed in what I was working on. I was just, I I was not thinking about anything anymore. I was just there in the, the pure act of drawing and... I kind of had my re- my passion reignited as a result, and I find that I found that to be ex- extremely fun. You know, it, it made me enjoy working on this comic a whole lot more, at least the pre-production stage of it. And so here we are. And as we work on this character concept, and we continue throughout it. I now want to draw your attention to back to what it is you're seeing happen here. And at this point, 
we've now got the basic sketch down. We've moved on from that. And we're polishing up that line work. We're sharpening it up. We're refining all the key contours within it. We're trying to make it as presentable as possible. My main goal here for this character that I've done up for Renegade Alpha is to create a finished comic book illustration, a finished comic book representation of who they are and how they're going to look. And the character designs I'd previously done up for Renegade Alpha weren't done to this degree, actually. They're a little bit more rough around the edges, a little bit more sketchy. So this one's much tighter. And as a result, I spent just a little bit more time on them. One of the reasons as to why I did that, besides, you know, trying to <laughs> end up with something just a bit more cooler than, than the previous characters, a bit more done, is because I was trying to figure out, well, what kind of style am I going to ultimately want this book to have? So I thought, well, why not warm up for that a little bit before I jump onto the comic itself? Why not practice the kind of style that I'll ultimately settle on for it during the pre-production phase as I designed these characters. And so that's exactly what I did. The kind of line work that you're seeing me throw down here, some of the rendering as well, this is pretty close to the style that I'll be going for in the finished version of Renegade Alpha. Now, of course, I will be applying lighting and, and shadows and probably heavier levels of rendering to the final pages of Renegade Alpha. But, you know, ultimately, this is this is much closer to the kind of style that I wanted to go for. And I was in the dark on that for a little bit. Oftentimes, especially when you're just starting out as an artist, you're exploring. You're trying to figure out, you know, how do I want my artwork to look? I've got all these people who inspire me, all these other artists that I look up to, and, and I love them all. But what style do I want for myself? And although all of those artists might influence you in one way or the other, you might add and take out uh, certain aspects, visual aspects from their work and incorporate it into your own along the way. But, um, but you know, that can be really tough in the beginning because you still don't necessarily know who you are as an artist yet. You're trying to find that artistic identity. And for me, that took a long time, funnily enough, because I think you second guess yourself a lot. And second guess myself, I did along the way. And I it wasn't really until right now. You know, I think because I'm a bit older and... I'm less stressed. <laughs> I know this seems weird, but the older you get, and I am only 30, but but I've found that over the years, as probably from the age of 25 onward, I've become more and more relaxed, less uptight, and less worried about certain things. And that doesn't just go for my art. It goes for, you know, me as a person. Um you know, you, you tend not to worry about the smaller things as much that used to bug you in your early 20s anymore. And so I have found that, you know, I'm almost less attentive when I'm drawing. I know that sounds like a bad thing almost, but it's not at all. I'm less self-conscious about how my art looks. And so because of that, I'm able to focus on different aspects of it. You know, there's only so much RAM that your brain has to use at any one point in time. There's only so much processing power. And so if your head is filled with, you know, all these other concerns, um, it means that you're not, there, there are other aspects of your art that you're going to be missing out on. And a lot of the time, because we're, we're so self-conscious about it, we're missing out on the better aspects of it, the more enjoyable aspects. And so, you know, for me, that's something that I've I've really ha in indulged in. Like, I've found it very pleasurable as of late to just sit down and draw and not worry so much. To get to that place is, is a really wonderful feeling. I think that that is the kind of place, actually, that we all dream of getting to when we set out to become comic book artists in the first place like we would we just want to draw we don't want to stress about it we want to have fun with it and it's almost like being a kid again 
Like I'm sitting here drawing up this character and I really do feel like, you know, I'm feeling the same joy that I got out of drawing as a kid when I was just drawing for the sake of drawing. Um, it didn't need to look a certain way. Uh, I, you know, everybody kind of gave you props for it. And, you know, I'm lucky enough that that people are like, you know, the, the impending audience for Renegade Alpha is actually enjoying the stuff that I've been putting out for it. You know, thousands of, of likes on Facebook, which absolutely blew me away. I didn't expect that at all. Um, in fact, all of these characters have been received in so, so well. And uh, that, of course, boosts my confidence because you just never know when you put this kind of content out there, what the reception is going to be. I think that's a deep seated fear for all of us as artists out there you know we're sharing our artwork with the world we we want them to love it we want them to enjoy it so of course we're looking for that validation and uh when we don't get it it can be kind of discouraging but this has been a great experience working on these characters for renegade alpha and as you can see here I've moved on from the main three-quarter full-body representation of the character shooter here, and I'm now jumping onto his headshots. And I guess this would be a good point to talk about who this character actually is. Where do they fit in to the world of Renegade Alpha? Shooter is... he's a young buck. He's got a bit of an attitude a problem with authority. He's the uh, 17 to 18, maybe 20 year old in all of us who just wants to leave home and do his own thing. You know, he's getting up to all kinds of mischief. Nobody can tell this kid what to do. And so he's part of the rescue squad who has been sent out to retrieve one of their own in the first issue of Renegade Alpha, one of their own who has been captured by the alien scum known as the Sarcophage. <laughs> and, you know, they've got to get to him in time because if they don't, the Sarcophage will turn their comrade into an abomination, an alien slash human mutant hybrid that is unfortunately something that is proven to wreak devastating damage on the human colonies that still exist on this future earth that's been picked to the bone by these alien invaders that's been utterly annihilated and taken over and so shooter he's he's the young guy within the team he has a few cool abilities which make up for his uh, his attitude problem. And one of those is that, and this is a really, really cool one. You're going to love this. You see these teched out gloves that he's wearing? Well, what they allow him to do is essentially auto-aim any weapon that he's holding and hit a bullseye on his target each and every time he pulls the trigger. Pretty cool, huh? So, you know, I thought that'd be a really awesome ability for this dude to have, especially since his name is Shooter. His real name, that's just his alias, by the way. His real name is Nathan Sharp. I believe we ended up calling this guy. Then, you know, everything is is still under development, and so these names may change later on. And even in the book itself... I will possibly end up making this guy look just a little bit younger. So I'll take out some of the defined features of his face especially, and I'll try to get that youth to come across. Uh, I loved adding in this rat's tail. I really think that it it got the point across that uh, this dude was yeah, a bit of a shithead. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh, you know, he's uh, he certainly rubs people up the wrong way. And working under the command of uh, Commander Slug, of course, is not something necessarily that he appreciates, young shooter here. But if you're going to argue with Commander Slug, you better have a damn good reason. Otherwise, he's going to certainly put you in your place. And that is exactly what happens within 
some of the first few pages of Renegade Alpha. You know, Shooter here, young Shooter, he harks up a little bit and uh, back chats to Commander Slug. Commander Slug, uh, you know, has about two seconds of patience with him before he's uh, he's got him held up by the shirt, shirt lifted against the wall. Um, so, you know, we see a few confrontations between the team members of, uh, of the rescue team that are sent out to to grab this guy, their, their fallen comrade, who, by the way, just between you and I, is actually the center of Renegade Alpha. He is the Renegade Alpha. Um, and as you can imagine, there is reasons as to why he becomes the Alpha species within this comic book. But I won't say much more than that. I have a habit of giving away spoilers, and so I'm going to close my mouth right there. But, you know, all of these characters, as I'm drawing them up on the page, I don't necessarily have a set vision for how they're going to look. Oftentimes, it all comes together as I'm working on it, as I'm developing it. So it's a, a much a surprise for me as it will be for you by the end of this demonstration as to how Shooter ultimately winds out looking. I mean, most of the details are there at this point. All I really need to do after I go ahead and place in the final line work for the following side view headshot and then the turnarounds that I'll add into the right at the bottom of the page there, um, you know, beyond that, it's just polishing up the line work, making sure that I'm adding in those line weights strategically to give the contours a little bit more oomph to increase the level of dimension within the artwork, even just through the key contours alone. And then, of course, we'll have a little bit of additional rendering there as well. But you can see me adding in those subtle line weights right now. You know, nothing too spectacular. It's all very, very subtle. And I think oftentimes, you know, not to toot my own horn here or anything, but really, honestly, you you don't want any one aspect of your artwork to be noticeable. It should all just look great, right? You just want it to have an overall positive experience for your audience. And I think that if you can pull that off, that's really the key because you got to realize that even though you're adding in all this crazy detail to your art, you can see me tweaking the techie sci-fi design of his gloves there just to really pull attention to the fact that, hey, these allow him to do something special. But as I said, you never want to draw the audience's attention to any one point within your artwork. You don't want them to notice the line weights. You don't want them to notice the rendering. All of that stuff is just, it's the ingredients that you're adding to the artwork. It's kind of like a good meal, right? You don't want any one flavor within that meal to be too overpowering. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to overall taste great. I like to use my metaphors to, to get across my points, as you can probably tell. But a good meal, again, you know, it's it's important that all of those flavors come together in a complementary manner to uh, ultimately give whoever is eating it a, a great experience. And that's exactly the same case with your artwork. You want the same thing. So don't push it too far. You know, don't over-render the heck out of absolutely everything within your art. Add, you know, pinches of it here and there in order for it to have it's the, the best amount of impact that it can have. Otherwise, it'll just be an oversaturated drawing that's visually indecipherable, too busy to look at. The audience wants to have an easy time interpreting what it is you're presenting to them. And so even though details, you know, tons of rendering, tons of texture work, uh, it may look cool. You want to make sure that all of that has been placed in with the purpose of creating uh, more readability within the artwork, of enhancing the depth and dimension to an appropriate level 
<laughs> you can see me here doing some pretty massive tweaks to the side profile view of Shooter's head here. I essentially just made a ma like a, a selection of the entire front of his face and pulled it forward. And you can do that stuff pretty easily when you're working digitally. And you can see here that, in fact, I've got a fairly traditional look to my digital work. Now, unfortunately, I'm not able to sell traditional pieces unless, for example, I print this off, off and ink over the top of it traditionally. But the advantages of doing digital work is that it's less expensive in the long run. You know, I don't have to go out there and order new supplies in order to keep on doing what it is I do best, what it is I love doing. That can really add up. That can be extremely expensive, especially if... You know, you're taking into account the cost of inks and quills and pencils and erasers and paper. That stuff gets used up the more you draw on it. Whereas with digital, you can redraw on this canvas as much as you like and it'll never wear out. It'll never get old. You'll be able to continue doing that day in and day out. Maybe you've got to order a new tablet However, I have had mine for like 10 years. It is an Intuos 3, and uh, and it's still going. You know, it's it's old faithful, I like to call it. <laughs> but digital has been something that took a lot of practice in order for me to get my artwork to look the way it does right now. Of course, I was very, very comfortable and very content in my traditional ways back when I was in high school. I think it was year 11, maybe year 12, when I first had my introduction into digital artwork. Back then, I was still doing all of my line work traditionally. However, I would scan that line work and I would try to add various filters over the top in Photoshop or Corel Paint that we had back then as well. And I'd try to, you know, do a digital rendition that made the line work cleaner. I was also doing a lot of digital coloring back then. And I guess, you know, especially for artists in my generation who, who were born in the 90s, uh, that we kind of know no other way. I think the, the image era especially brought the various techniques and tactics of digital comic book colors to the forefront. You know, I remember that one of the first tutorials that I ever watched that gave me the lowdown on comic book coloring was How to Color the Spawn Way by Brian, Brian Haberlin, I believe. And you may even still be able to get this very tutorial on their website, Digital Tutorials, Digital Art Tutorials, I think it was called. And this taught me it basically everything that I knew when it came to comic book coloring for a very long time until I developed my own way of doing things, my own techniques. And you'll find that you tend to do that yourself. Everything that I'm showing you here, yes, you can pay attention to it. You can apply it. You can try it out for yourself. And it may even work for you really, really well for a while. But eventually you're going to accidentally stumble upon your own way of doing things. And it's just going to work better everybody's different. Everybody's unique. That's what makes our artwork special from one artist to the next. And you don't really ever want to 100% settle on using the techniques and methods of any one artist in particular. Otherwise, you'll just be a clone of them. And that's all good and well, but you'll never be as good as the original. You may somewhat perfect the original but here's here's the real kicker even the imperfections that you correct within their work is precisely what gives their work the charm that it has so it's almost like you know eventually you've got to build on top of what you learn from other artists you've got to combine multiple influences and really find your own artistic identity and a lot of the time i think that's what improving within your artistic skill set is all about just getting to know yourself as an artist. You know, what kind of brush size do you enjoy working with? What kind of line work do you enjoy articulating your finished contours with? How much rendering do you like to use? Too much? Too little? Maybe somewhere in between is your ideal amount. 
It really does depend on your personal preference. And hey, sometimes you don't even know what that is, right? Until you find it. And find it you will, just through exploration, making mistakes. I think the best way to learn is just to draw every single day. That is the best way to get to know yourself as an artist, to to know who you are. And how you like to work, how how you enjoy working with the tools. You know, you've got to get to know the tool set that you've got available to you. And then the way in which you use that tool set, the way in which you manipulate it to do your will, then that's exactly what's going to allow you to become the ultimate artist that you can be, the epitome of what you can be as a comic book illustrator. So I'm going through, I'm adding in these line weights to the headshots of Shooter here, just mostly going around the outside contours of the major sections, so around his face, the outside of his face, the outside of his hair, but I'm not line weighting every single little minute detail within the hair, for example. I've left a nice rhythm of thick to thin lines there and we want that contrast because if I start going in and I add these big bold heavy lines to the interior details of Shooter's hair here well that's going to mess up the readability his hairstyle won't be as defined it won't appear as defined there'll be a certain level of additional busyness there so you're only outlining really the key areas when it comes to defining those line weights. It's always something which is important to keep in mind. You'll notice as well that as I keep on working here, I'm getting that lasso tool out and I'm making selections around various portions of the drawing and I'm rejigging it as necessary. There is nothing which has been so developed at this point that I can't change it. And especially when it comes to the faces of my characters, I feel like it's so important to make sure that I take the time and, and energy to get them looking as good as they can be. Because here's the thing, guaranteed, the first place that your audience's eyes are going to travel to is the faces of your characters. That's how we relate with people. You know, we're looking for a lot of emotional cues to figure out, you know, how that person is feeling. Is that glare on their face and the fr or the frown and the grimace? Is is that a sign that they're going to attack us or kill us? <laughs> is the smile a sign that they like us, that they enjoy our company, that we should stay a little longer? You know, we are very attuned to faces because we're trying to always get a read from whoever it is we're experiencing, from whoever it is we're communicating with. And so because that's how we relate to people in real life, we also tend to, when we see a drawn face, try to relate with the character we're looking at in the same way. Which means you do want a certain level of emotional expression coming through in the faces of your characters, but you also want them to be drawn well because the audience will be looking toward their face in order to gauge that emotional state that the character is in. It's just a habit, you know, it's a social habit that humans have developed in order to get a read on people. And we do it even when we're looking at illustrated depictions of people's heads, believe it or not. That's just the way in which we are programmed. So now I'm taking my attention to the turnaround shot of Shooter. It's a little smaller, but it does represent how his design is going to appear, not now just from the three-quarter view, but also from the side view and the back view. We're getting a nice full-body look at what his design will entail from these key points of view. And this is a back three-quarter view that I'm working on as well. So it's a more three it's another three-dimensional representation, I should say, from a different point of view that allows us to get a good look at exactly what Shooter's design consists of. And it's important that we have that there because if we just stop at the three-quarter view or even just at the side view, and there comes a point within the comic book itself where we've got to draw the character from behind, which is very, very likely since we're dealing with dynamic sequences most of the time in a comic book. Um, we don't want to be stuck 
we don't want to arrive at a place where we're scratching our heads wondering what the heck this character is supposed to look like from behind. We want the roadmap set by that point. We want to know exactly what needs to be placed where and how their outfit is going to appear from all of the key angles before we, we jump into the sequentials. And this is especially important if you are intending to get another illustrator on board to do those interiors for you then it's even more important because they need to know what that character is going to look like from one viewpoint to the next because you know they're not a mind reader even if you have somehow fleshed this out inside your mind and you have the perfect vision of how it's going to look the other artist that is working with you on the project isn't going to be aware of that. They're not going to have that level of clarity. So you got to make sure that they've got enough information there to realize that vision to the most accurate point of representation that they can get it to. So messing around a little bit with exactly how his armor is going to look from behind and there's a lot of different options that I can go with here. I've got a bunch of references that I'm using for both accuracy and inspiration as I'm pulling this design together. And I like to make sure that I've got a good amount of ideas in my well of creativity. And a lot of the time, it is those references that you know replenish any creative blockages that I end up having along the way. If I ever get stuck as to what I'm going to come up with next for the design, I just look to those references and usually I've got a few of them um, within a certain theme, of course. We're looking at paramilitary type references here. So I've got a bunch of stuff. I'm also trying to make sure that these characters resemble somewhat of a, a 90s action hero, right? And so I've got a lot of 90s comic book characters in my reference sheet i've got a bunch of uh, old movie posters as well you know i want i want that nice retro feel to renegade alpha and so all of the characters that i'm designing within it are going to uphold that vision as closely as i can possibly get them to anyway so you can see me going in now back to the full body three quarter representation or the beauty shot if you will of shooter and i'm adding in some minor rendering and you'll notice that these are just very subtle nicks of detail that i'm adding in across the armor i'm also defining those line weights more as well to create some separation between the layered metal that his chest piece consists of and you can see that not a whole lot of rendering is needed here in order to get the forms reading to the extent that I want them to read. This is wonderful in multiple ways. It gets across the forms with the right level of definition, but at the same time, it doesn't take too long. You know, I'm not sitting there adding in crosshatch after crosshatch. I'm able to get the character done in a timely manner. So... I've, for the longest time, been trying to figure out a way in which I'm able to optimize my process because I'm a relatively slow artist. You know, I'm, not a, I'm not a fast artist. I wish I was. I wish that I could get my artwork down onto the page in a speedy amount of time and to the quality that I like it to be at. But unfortunately, it's just something that I struggle with. And... So, you know, I'm not as productive as I want to be sometimes, which is why I'm always looking for ways in which I can give the illusion of my artwork still being to the same level of quality that it always has been, but uh, maybe leave out certain things that aren't really needed in the first place. I found that if I, if I render things out to too much of a more de degree than this, then I end up with something that just looks over detailed, too visually busy, and it doesn't really add a whole lot. In fact, it, it takes away from the artwork a little bit. This was something I had to learn along the way. It took me a while to learn it too, because I was a big fan of David Finch, and I still am a big fan of David Finch. And if you know David Finch's work, 
you will you'll agree with me when I say that it is insanely detailed. You've got a lot of shadow work happening. You've got a lot of cross hatching, and it makes for a much more dramatic and intense representation of the idea that's being portrayed within his artwork, whatever it is that he's presenting. And so I wanted to have that drama within my own art. I wanted that that cinematic quality to it, especially in regards to the shadows and the rendering. But, uh, you know, for me, it was something that just took so long. And when I did do it, it was a very fine balance between detailed enough and overly detailed right and so you know i took it back a few notches i started looking at the work of david uh, uh, rather i started looking at the work of mark silvestri which is still very detailed but detailed in a different way i started looking at the work especially of michael turner and michael turner was an important point of reference for me because he seemed to still create artwork that was as desirable and as aesthetically pleasing as David Finch's or Mark Silvestri's very, very beautiful artwork, but without a whole lot of rendering. In fact, a lot of the quality within his art, a lot of that that, that aesthetic came purely from his expert, masterful use of line weights. And so I realized what an important role a line weights actually played within my art. And so I focused on them for a while. I cut back on the amount of detail. I cut back on all the rendering. And I tried to make sure that I was defining every single shape within my my characters, within what it was that I was drawing, with carefully placed, strategically placed line weights that added to the definition of just the key contours themselves. And... I found that that just added so much. And then I didn't need as much detail. Then I didn't need as much rendering to have uh, to to make the art look the way that I wanted it to. And I, I realized just how little that rendering actually added at the end of the day to the overall perceived quality of my drawings. You know, it took a while and it did look cool, but it didn't add as much as carefully placed line weights added to my art. I found that the emphasis of shape within my art really was a big game changer for me and enhanced the quality of my drawings overall. And, you know, the the rendering was great, but rendering only really works if you use it within the correct context. When it is really necessary, you really have to think about the purpose as to every hatch play, as to what every hatch plays when you lay it lay it down onto the forms throughout your character onto the surface textures throughout your character because if you're not aware of why it is you're rendering the heck out of a particular portion of your drawing that that's when you're going to find that all of a sudden it becomes unbalanced it it doesn't make sense it's like actually what happens if you don't correctly balance it out, is you end up with something that has no depth and that is completely flat and confusing to look at. That's really what over-rendered artwork suffers from the most. And so for me, I wanted to stay as far away from that as possible. I didn't want necessarily a finished aesthetic that looked as clean or as polished as Michael Turner's, or Joe Mads, for example. I did want just that little bit more grunginess there because I was also a big fan of Todd McFarlane who and Greg Capullo back in the day with his early stuff who did really pump up the grunginess of their visuals, especially in, in the comic book Spawn. But, you know, I wanted to, to kind of offset, offset that a little bit with a simpler style. And I feel like I arrived at something that did allow me to do that and also appealed to my audience. As I said, Shooter here, Beretta before, and the the latest concept that I've just done after Shooter as well, which I'm going to also release a demo on at a later date, they've all had such a wonderful response. And that has been something that's been very, very reassuring for me. It's It's something that I value a lot, especially because of the aforementioned 
changes that I've made to my style and arriving at a way of working that I feel truly comfortable with. As I said before, I think you've got to have fun with this stuff. I think that you've got to feel comfortable when you're working because that's when you're going to do your best work, when you are having fun. If you're stressing out about it, if you're worried the entire way through about certain aspects and how they're going to look in the end, then that level of stress is going to show through. And unfortunately, as much as you've worried about it, that's exactly what's going to cause it not to live up to its potential. And that's the sad truth of the matter is you just gotta you just gotta chill out, you gotta relax a little bit, and let the chips fall where they may sometimes. You just gotta cross your fingers and hope for the best. You're only as good as you are. I mean, if you're not satisfied with the level at which you're at with your art, then you gotta watch more demos like this. And you actually gotta pay attention. You gotta apply what it is you're seeing. I know that there's a lot of drawing demos out there these days. More than enough to keep you occupied and and maybe to the point where, where you're bored of seeing them. But I'm telling you, if you really pay attention to this demonstration, you whip out your pencil and your paper afterwards and you do like a replication of this character. Or you, you do your own character, but you go through it, developing it in the same way in which I've shown you here throughout this video you're going to find that with repetition and practice that you will be able to increase your level of ability tenfold. Study up. If you're not happy with where your artwork's at, if you're not drawing the kind of, art, the kind of comic book illustrations that you always dreamed of drawing, then pay your dues, you know, Go through the trials and tribulations that every other artist has to go through. And oftentimes that's hours and hours and late nights of, of just study, practicing. Lots of anatomy studies, studying from observation, studying from other artists. One of the ways in which I learned the best was to go out there, find a bunch of artworks, a bunch of illustrations for my favorite artists, like the aforementioned David Finch, Mark Silvestri, uh, Todd McFarlane, and I do literal replications of those artworks with pen and paper. And I, n I never released them and said that they were my own, of course. I think that there was a blog that I was running like ages and ages ago and like blogger. And I would post my progress on there and I'd talk about how I was using them to study and and work out my my own style. Because I figured, even though I could never call these artworks my own, of course, I could still learn something from them. Maybe along the way I would figure out, you know, why it was they were rendering in a particular way. And I think that that's why, what the, the biggest benefit you could get from doing a style study like that because it does help you to develop your own style. It helps you to learn how to use the pen or your pencil in a certain way in order to, to achieve a particular result that you're, you're striving toward, that you're striving to see within your own artistic presentations. And you've got to expose yourself to that as much as possible in order to properly comprehend it. And that's what all of this stuff is about. That's what practicing is about. It's about that exposure. The more you expose yourself to it, the better you're going to get at it. We all know this. You know, it's been said again and again many, many times by many, many different comic book veterans out there. And it's no joke. I know that it's something that is said all the time, but really, if you just sit down and you start doing these studies, your progress of development will increase. And it can be really hard, especially with all the distractions that we've got with, you know, social media and Instagram, Facebook, and well, you know, the, the amount of things I've had to juggle lately, it's absolutely crazy. Um, but, you know, it can be very hard to just switch all of that off sit down for a few hours and do a drawing study. 
but you got to do it. There's no other way around it. And I guess what you can do is find some level of reassurance that because it's so hard to break away from all of these distractions for everyone else, that if you can do it, you're doing something that very few people are able to do still. And man, I, I really do like making myself sound old, but I grew up in, in a time where we were like the, the 90s kids were kind of at this transition where the internet had only just come in. There was no social media yet, even at that time. It was just, you know, uh, you'd, you'd jump onto, onto the internet to, to search, you know, the, the information on video games and, and news articles and stuff like that. Um, or, or, you know, inspirational artwork, comic book artwork. The internet was very, very young back then. We had brick phones that only had black and white graphics on them. And this was only, you know, maybe like 20 years ago. 20 years ago. That uh, sounds kind of a long time ago, doesn't it? <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't feel like that that much long ago. And I've, I'm selling my dad right now, my mum. But it wasn't that long ago. And so we were right there for that transition where we slowly but surely became as hypnotized as everybody else by the level of immersion that social media provided for us. And it became harder and harder to focus on any one thing for an extended period of time. Even now, it becomes difficult for me to focus on drawing for more than an hour. I slipped out of that habit, unfortunately. Whereas before... Oh man, I was there for like hours on end. I wouldn't get up and walk around. I wouldn't disconnect for hours. I'd be there tearing out a drawing. I'd be able to complete it in one sitting. But now because my brain is so addicted to new forms of input being injected into it every you know few minutes, it's really, really difficult for me to, to not hunger for a dopamine spike. Um... And dopamine, of course, is something that's released within your brain. It's it's a pleasure chemical, right? And our brain really loves to to get um, new new stimulation, right? So if you get a like on Facebook or you you get a comment in or, or an, even an email, right? It's like oh, new information, right? It and we have a very very small attention span now. We get bored so easily, and because that focus muscle is so limp for me right now, it's something that even I have to build up more of. And all of this is to say that, hey, I get it. If you're just starting out as an artist, you're, you're a young person who is just coming up in the game, or even an older uh, person who has just realized their, their passion for comic book illustration, and you're starting from the ground up, it's really difficult to, to switch off all the distractions and just sit down and get that pencil moving on the page or on the stylus if you're a digital artist, as is my case. But if you can do it, you're going to be a, you're going to be the ahead of the curb of so many other people who wish that they could do it, who wish that they could. You know, we we always whinge and whine about not having enough time, but in reality, we got tons of time. It's just that we sink that time a lot of. Uh, on a lot of occasions, into the the things that distract us, and really don't give us any return on the investment that we put into them. That's the saddest part. Is uh, it it literally is a, a waste of time. A lot of what we spend our time on. So, at least if you are using social media, my advice would be to use it to promote yourself, to promote your artwork to build up an audience. That's one of the greatest advantages that I think it brought us artists is it allowed us to reach out to people much more easily to spread our artwork and and get it out there in front of people more than ever, more than ever we could before. And so use it for that reason, absolutely. But, um, you know, and this is advice that I've got to take for myself as well. Don't get too caught up in everything else that it offers because 
it's not unheard of for me to waste an entire day watching videos on YouTube and getting absolutely nothing done. And you know what happens for me when that when I fall into that trap? I wind out at the end of that day feeling depressed. And I'm not someone who has suffered from clinical depression before. You know, I can I can monitor my emotional state pretty easily. I know that when I'm feeling down, I probably need to sleep or I need something to eat. Uh, but there is nothing more depressing to me than wasting an entire day on crap, essentially, just social media stuff that, that is of no value. I haven't built anything. I haven't nothing that I've spent my time on has resulted in a tangible outcome. And that just, it grinds my gears. And I get so disappointed in myself. You know, I'm sure that you can relate if you've ever fallen into the same trap. It's, there's there's nothing worse. And so you've got to be hard on yourself sometimes and, you know, take out the, the Ethernet cable from the back of your computer, switch off the wireless if need be so that you can start the day fresh and do nothing but draw for that day. Even if you set aside like one or two days a week to do it, that's better than none. It's better than half assing it the rest of the time. But as you can see, I'm a perfectionist when it comes to this stuff. Um, you know, just winding winding up the rest of this illustration. And, you know, Shooter here, he, he was a, a much more polished representation of the character that I was trying to create for him, this this character sheet that we've taken the time to do up. And I was glad that I spent the amount of time on him that I did. I feel like going forward with the rest of these character concepts that I'm going to take them to a similar level of completion. I kind of see it as as practice almost. You know, I'm warming up for the comic book itself because I know that I want to be bringing my A game to that. I want to be making sure that when you guys read my comic book, the first comic book that I'm ever going to publish, that I'm ever going to put out there, that you're seeing the best work that I've ever done. And hopefully, with all the issues of Renegade Alpha that I hope to release there on after, I will continue to improve. I will continue to keep on upping my skill set and challenging myself in various ways. Of course, it's it's never fun at all to make mistakes along the way or to do less than what you know you're capable of but i feel like you know you do have to be challenged you if everything goes perfectly all of the time then you're going to find that you lose the passion you lose that hunger to keep on striving for a a higher level of mastery within your own comic book art abilities <laughs> Well, that just about wraps up today's demonstration. I truly do hope that you got a ton of value out of it. Thanks for watching. If you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and tutorials, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net. Over on the site, you'll find a ton of written tutorials, video tutorials. We've even got a podcast. And when you're ready to take your comic art skill set to the next level, I highly suggest that you check out our premium selection of comic art courses. Now, the other thing that I'd like to tag on the end here is that Corey and I, my brother, we are going to be in a few months running our very first comic book campaign for a title called Kozor. Now, it is written and illustrated by Corey. But I'm going back over the top of it, and I'm going to be fixing up the line work, retweaking it, polishing it up, redialing the colors, making sure that we're getting that artwork to pop off of the page as much as possible. I'm going to be doing some editing to the dialogue, and I'm even going to be doing an exclusive cover for this release of Kozor. So this is going to be a true Barton Bros collaboration. If you like dark fantasy, video games such as Darksiders or anime such as Berserk, then this book really is for you. It's going to be 43 pages of intense nightmare fueled artwork from the mind of Corey. And it's something that we're both very, very excited about. It's an absolute pleasure to be working with Corey on this project. 
and we can't wait to get it out to you. We will be releasing more information on Kozor as we get closer to the launch date for our campaign, but for now, what you can do is head on over to the pre-launch page for Kozor and sign up to the email list for special VIP rewards and perks if you back on day one. Again, we're really looking forward to this. You can also find out more information about what Corey and I are up to at our very own studios website, bartonbrosstudios.com. You can also sign up to the email list there in order to get news and updates, not only on Kozor and Renegade Alpha, but also a bunch of other stuff like the various collaborations that we're doing with our fellow comic book creators out there. Well, that's about all for today. Again, thanks so much for joining me for another comic art tutorial. Until next time, keep on drawing, keep on practicing, and I'll see you in the next video.